Let's design the high-level architecture of a YouTube-style application. By the way, this video is taken from my system design interview course, which you can check out on neatcode.io. Now let's design YouTube. First, let's go over the background, even though I'm sure you're familiar with how YouTube and other types of video sites like Netflix and others work. Compared to Netflix, YouTube is a bit different in that users can actually upload videos and it's actually free as well. Pretty much anyone can upload videos. And of course, if we can upload videos, we can also choose to watch videos as users. And when it comes to YouTube, this is actually the core functionality, though that doesn't mean it's simple to implement. There's a ton of complexity with reaching the scale that YouTube does with even just these two features, but this is actually not all that YouTube is capable of doing. There's a lot of data. You can obviously search for videos. You can obviously have uh, videos recommended and, you know, designing that recommendation system could be its own design problem, but even then it would not be able to be fully described and designed in a 45 minute interview, of course. And users can, of course, you know, comment and interact with videos by liking or disliking them. And there's a ton of probably analytics that goes on with reporting views. And I'm sure there's like bot prevention with like comments, even though there's a ton of bots in the comments lately and advertising. And, you know, the list could go on and on. The point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to an ambiguous kind of design proposal like this, there's many different directions we could go in. And of course, we can't explore all of them. So then moving on to the functional requirements, let's say that the main features that we want to focus on are going to be uploading videos from a user's perspective and then watching videos from a user's perspective. So these are the two main functional requirements we want to focus on. If we have time at the end, maybe we can kind of explore how we can extend our design to handle additional functionality. But you know, these are the main things that we want to be able to focus on. When it comes to non-functional requirements, a first one that comes to mind is reliability when it comes to videos. You would never want to run into an issue where somebody uploads a video and then that video video is somehow corrupted or deleted. We definitely don't expect that when we're storing something on YouTube. Even though it's free, we wouldn't want a video to just disappear. So we really need the videos to be extremely reliable, at least in terms of storage. And talking about the scale that we're going to be handling, even a single video can have potentially thousands of concurrent viewers. So that's what we have to kind of keep in mind. Of course, we're going to have a ton of users. Let's assume that we're designing YouTube to handle a billion daily active users, which is about accurate, I think. Now, when it comes to these users, let's say that each user is watching five videos per day, but the upload ratio is going to be a hundred users are watching videos for every one user uploading a video, or, you know, this is the ratio of reads versus writes for videos. So if we have five users watching a video per day, we have 5 billion of videos being watched per day. If the ratio is a hundred to one, that means 1% 1 of 5 billion is going to be the number of videos uploaded per day. So that is going to be 50 million videos uploaded per day. So a massive amount of throughput. Now, the good thing is among these 50 million videos, most of them probably aren't going to be getting a ton of views. If I had to guess, I bet, you know, the top 5% of videos account for like 90% of the views, but this is just off the top of my head. But I think we can kind of design this in a way that we assume that, you know, most videos will not be getting views, though they do still have to be, you know, stored and we can't let them get deleted. Now, in most cases, doing a bunch of complex math isn't super important. It's about coming to the right conclusion conclusions, which we kind of are. We also have to keep in mind that when it comes to availability, we definitely want to favor availability over consistency. What do I mean by that? Well, every time you go on YouTube and you refresh the YouTube homepage and you want to see like a bunch of videos on your homepage, every time you make that request, every time you refresh, you should get a correct response. You should get an HTTP 200 response and things should load. And it's okay if we have to sacrifice consistency consistency to achieve that. What do I mean by that? Well, what if you're in your subscription feed and somebody just uploaded a new video, somebody you're subscribed to just uploaded a new video one second ago, and you just refreshed your homepage, you see a bunch of videos in your subscription feed, but none of them appear to be 
be the one that was just uploaded a second ago. Hypothetically, this could happen if we have multiple storage systems and one of the storage systems that you happen to be reading from when you refreshed the page was this one, but this one did not have the most up-to-date data. This one did not have the new video uploaded, but this one did. But eventually that video will be replicated to the other storage, but it just takes a few seconds. So you're getting stale data. Our data storage is not favoring consistency, it's favoring availability. And the worst thing that would happen in this case is most likely you would have to wait a little bit longer. Maybe when a new video is uploaded, you have to wait five seconds before you can actually see it, or maybe in the worst case, something like 10 seconds. But is that really that big of a deal? I think it would be a lot worse if you refresh the page and it didn't return anything to you at all. And lastly, we want to obviously minimize the latency as much as possible. When you click to watch a video, ideally it should start playing immediately, even if the entire video isn't loaded. And if we have a good internet connection, we shouldn't have to experience any buffering or waiting for the video to load. Now let's start with the high level design. And I'm going to start with the user journey of uploading a video because uploading is probably going to be more uh, complicated than actually watching a video. And this will probably give us a better sense of the infrastructure that's going to be involved with our design. Now, since we're dealing with such a massive scale, 50 million uploads per day, we probably can't handle that with a single server. So we would most likely have a load balancer sitting in between a bunch of application servers so that we can kind of scale this horizontally. Now, this is a pretty generic thing. For now, let's just assume that how we kind of do this doesn't really matter whether, you know, the user hits this application server or this one. So for now, I'm going to simplify our design and just kind of draw it like the user is making an upload request to the application server, even though under the hood, we know it's of course going to need to be load balanced. Now, even the act of uploading a video is not as simple as it might sound. What happens if there's a short like internet connection breakage, like even for just a second, and we're uploading a file that's like over a gigabyte, we were already halfway through, but now would we have to restart over or could we start where we left off? Let's assume that this is not the direction that we want to go in. And we can just kind of say that once the video is uploaded, it's going to be stored in some object storage. And let's say that this is where we're going to store the raw files that the user uploads. But firstly, the reason we're using an object store is because that's a lot better for storing media and large files like videos. We probably don't need to store that in like a relational database, for example. And also object storage, typically, you know, something like AWS S3 or Google Cloud storage, they kind of handle that replication for us. So we can kind of safely assume that if we store something in an object store, we don't have to worry about it being deleted. And that's generally how cloud a file storage works, like things like Google Drive are actually built on top of object storage. So at a high level, we can safely assume that we have our reliability covered. Now, storing the videos here is fine, but what about the actual metadata associated with every video? Going over what the API for uploading would look like, it would obviously have like a title and a description and like the actual like video content itself, maybe something like an MP4. That's what's going to actually be stored in object storage. And, you know, there could be a bunch of other things that we store, you know, things like tags and stuff like that. But this isn't really the important part, knowing like every single field that you would want to store with a video. But most importantly, we also want to associate every single video with a user. Because remember, every time you, you know, go on YouTube and you watch a video, underneath there is usually like the profile picture and the username of the person who actually uploaded it. This isn't like Netflix where you just have, you know, shows on YouTube, people are actually creating the videos, the content creators. So, you know, every time we want to actually show a video to a user, we're going to have to join that video with uh, the user information and the video metadata of the video itself and like the person who created it, of course. So long story short, every time we upload a video, we're also going to be storing metadata associated with that video. And we're also going to be storing user information in this uh, database. And I'm choosing to do a NoSQL database because we're going to have so many videos uploaded, probably going to be needing to read this metadata very frequently. In this database itself, we can store a reference to the video file in the object store, and that should be fine. Now, let's say for the NoSQL, we're using something like MongoDB, which if you don't recall, it doesn't store things in tables and rows like a SQL database. It stores things kind of like in a JSON format. The terms are a collection. We can have a collection of documents, and a document is pretty similar to a JSON object. It's very flexible. So let's say, you know, one collection is videos. Every video document will have all the information about a single video that we need. And we also have another collection for a user and, you know, all their information. You might be thinking if a user, you know, wants to watch a certain video, don't we have to then perform a join with a user? Well, not necessarily. 
with NoSQL databases like MongoDB, we can have our data uh, denormalized is the correct term. Normalized in SQL is basically like you don't store duplicate data. You have separate tables. And then if you want to aggregate or combine information, you can join those tables. But in MongoDB, you don't have to do that. We can actually store duplicate information. So in every video, we actually would store the relevant user information. Like we know when a, a user w goes on YouTube and wants to watch a YouTube video, they kind of see that profile picture of the user. Like that's one example that I'm going to be talking about right now. Well, that profile picture is probably also going to be stored in object storage somewhere. So that profile picture will probably have a reference to it in the user documents, but we'll also actually have it stored in every video document of, you know, the creator of that video. So we'll have duplicate references to it, but that's okay in NoSQL because it at the very least does improve a performance. We don't have to perform joins. Now, the question is what happens if a user actually updates their profile picture? Yes, we'd have to update, you know, the user document, but then we have to update every single uh, video document where that person created a video. And maybe they have a hundred videos or maybe they have a thousand videos. We'd have to update all of those documents. And in this case, that's okay because first of all, they're probably not going to be uh, updating their profile picture very frequently. You know, uploading a video is probably more frequent and watching a video is more frequent. So that's kind of what we're favoring here, reads over writes. But also if they update their profile picture, you know, we can kind of update all of those video documents asynchronously. We don't have to do it immediately. Is it going to be the end of the world if somebody sees an old profile picture from this user for a few minutes or maybe even an hour? Probably not. So these are some details that we could kind of discuss. This is probably not, you know, high level. So let's kind of continue with the rest of our design. Now, when it comes to videos, encoding is actually a big part of it. As users upload videos like raw video files to YouTube, YouTube does a lot of video encoding and compression to get the size of those videos down. And encoding a video is not something that can happen like in one second. This is definitely an asynchronous task. So it can take on the order of minutes to typically uh, encode files. And if they're you know really large files, I think YouTube will allow you to even upload like a 24 hour video file. It can probably take hours to do the encoding for that, which is the reason why we are using a message queue for that. Now there's a lot of domain knowledge that would be needed to understand video encoding. And that's not what we really want to dive into. So let's just keep it high level. As raw video files are uploaded, we're going to be storing them, but we're also going to be adding them to a queue so that they can be sent to another service, which is going to be handling the encoding. And it's probably not going to be, you know, a single server that's going to be doing that. We're probably going to have a ton of servers to do that. After the videos are encoded, they are going to be stored in object storage because, you know, they're still videos. We probably still want to store them in object storage to make sure that they are uh, reliably stored and replicated and videos are immutable. So we don't really need like a Hadoop file system or something like that. Object storage is probably good enough. We're not going to be, you know, updating a video. We'll be updating like metadata associated with it. But, you know, with a video, we're either going to uh, upload it, we might delete it, but that's pretty much it. You're not going to be editing the video. Now, this is how a video can be uploaded. But what about actually watching a video? Well, we want the reads to be as fast as possible. We want the latency to be as low as possible. So anywhere we can kind of add caching is going to be really, really helpful. We know users aren't going to be reading, uh, you know, raw video files. They're going to be reading encoded video files. And we probably want to have these distributed around the world, but also to have the video stored as close as possible to end users, we can have a, a CDN service, which, you know, does exactly that. It distributes uh, static files geographically. And so when a user wants to watch a video, the video file itself is going to be loaded via the CDN, which is going to be pulling from the object storage. But the user can fetch like the actual metadata associated with a video from a database, but to actually speed that up, because probably we know that a small amount of videos are going to be getting the most amount of views, we can probably add a cache in front of our uh, database. And that cache, of course, is going to be an in-memory cache. That's the whole point of speeding it up, because disk is, of course, slower than memory, but this can probably not store every video that we need. So we'll have to have you know some way to kick videos off. Most likely, newer videos are going to be getting more views, so we can probably have like an LRU cache implemented here. So now, finally, let's actually start digging into some of the details. And the first thing I actually want to talk about is this encoding part over here. More specifically, we talked about we could have 50 million videos uploaded per day. So my question is, how many uh, workers here, assuming that they can actually encode the videos in parallel, which, you know, this is a pretty easy service to scale horizontally, at least at the high level. I'm not saying, you know, video encoding 
is an easy uh, topic to understand. But assuming that at a high level, you know, one worker can encode one video at a time. So if one person uploads multiple videos or, you know, 10 people are uploading videos at the same time, they'll be added to the queue and then they'll reach the encoding service before they're actually encoded and written to storage. But the point is that multiple videos can be encoded at the same time. There's no like dependency or anything like that. So if we have 50 million uploads per day, and assuming that every video takes one minute to encode, which is probably too small, it would probably take longer than that on average. But let's say, you know, these workers are really, really good. They have really good resources. And maybe most videos that we upload are going to be pretty short. So in terms of capacity planning, how many workers would we need here? Well, 50 million uploads per day. That's assuming 100 seconds in a day. We can divide that by 100,000. I think we get to roughly 500 videos per second are going to be uploaded per day. Day. So, you know, the first thing on your mind would be, well, can we just have 500 workers? No, that's pretty naive because remember we said that it takes one minute to upload or to encode every video on average, let's say. So if we only had 500 workers, and in the first second, we have 500 videos uploaded. Okay, each of those workers is encoding a single video. Now, one more second goes by and we have 500 more videos uploaded, but every worker is busy. So we add those 500 to the queue. And then another second goes by and we add 500 more. And you know, that this keeps happening until one minute has passed. And then finally, these 500 are done and we can store them. And now the workers can get 500 more uh, videos. But by this point, our queue would be backloaded pretty hard. At this rate, we would never get through the backlog. So we need more than 500 workers. If you do the math, there's 60 seconds in a minute. So multiply 500 by 60, you'd get to 30K workers. And this is roughly the answer I personally would be looking for. Now with video encoding, it's probably pretty hard to get an accurate estimate. And I'm not sure if you know one worker can actually handle multiple uh, videos at once. Maybe that's the case. But the important thing I would be looking for if I asked you this is that you know we definitely need more than 500 workers. We need more than how many videos are going to be uploaded in a second. That's for sure. Now, another interesting thing about this problem is actually watching a video. Let's talk about some details on how this can be optimized. And the best way to do so is by looking at an example. So right now I'm on YouTube on my channel specifically. I'm going to go ahead and open up our dev tools and we're going to be focusing on the network tab. I'm also going to filter this on XHRs and I'm going to click one of the shorter videos. You'll see why in just a second. So first thing you see here is this is how much of the video has buffered. You can see this portion of the video has buffered. When we watch a YouTube video, we don't need to wait for the entire video to download before we watch it. We're going to be starting at the beginning, presumably. We only need the beginning to be loaded. But watch what happens when I click over here. If I skip to this part of the video, we would, well, it just kind of loaded a little bit. So now I'm going to skip over here. Watch what happens. See, it kind of immediately buffers. So that's what we want to do. We don't need the entire video to be loaded, but it's true that some people might be skipping around. They might skip around to this part, which seems to be popular. And that, you know, this part of the video has not loaded. Only this part has. So what's going to happen when I click here? Well, that part got loaded. And what's actually happening here, if we scroll down in the request, the most recent request is a request to actually load that portion of the video. We are not using a streaming to do this. We're actually making HTTP requests to load chunks of the video. I'm going to kind of expand this here. You can see a request was made here and what the response was looks like gibberish to us because this is actually, you know, that portion of the video. And going back to the headers, when you scroll down to the response headers, you can see that, okay, actually this was not the video. This content type is audio. So I'm going to hit the second one over here actually and scrolling down to the header and then looking at the content type, we see that this one was the video. So actually it looks like the audio is being fetched separately from the video. Video. So this, when we look at the response, is probably the video. Before, we were probably looking at the audio, not that it looks any different to us. And I'm going to go ahead and refresh this and do it one more time. So we can see, pausing this, a portion of the video has loaded here. So we're going to scroll down to uh, the requests. We can see the video playback requests are the ones that are actually loading the video itself. And as I click here, new chunk of video was loaded. So let's scroll all the way down to see that one. Over here, these uh, multiple requests. 
requests and you can see that uh, some of them are larger than others. But the point is that one megabyte of data is easier to transfer than the entire video, which might be, I don't know, like 20 or 30 megabytes. And this is the technique to lower latency, loading a video via smaller chunks. Now, while rendering and loading videos is also a domain knowledge heavy topic, I still think it's worth mentioning because that technique that we kind of just went over, small chunks of videos, it's a pretty simple concept to understand at the high level. We don't need to send the entire video to the user before they can start watching it. We can just send them small chunks of the portion that they're actually watching. Now, another relevant question would be, what protocol should we use for sending videos? And by the way, what we just talked about is called video streaming, not necessarily live streaming, because we know that video is already stored. It's not like a live feed, but the video is being streamed, meaning it's being sent in small chunks versus like when you actually download a video, that's not streaming. That's like taking the entire file that's stored and then sending it to your computer and then storing it. Whereas video streaming, I believe those small chunks are actually stored in your computer's memory, which is also why you would not want the entire video to be taking up all of your memory. So most likely there is some client side code that is handling that and freeing memory because it's pretty easy to write client side JavaScript that will crash your browser and take up all your memory. So that's kind of something as a front end developer you might want to keep in mind. Because if we were watching like a 10 hour long video, which definitely exists on YouTube, we would not need the entire video to be buffered in our memory. We could just skip around the video. But going back to what protocol we might want to use for this, since we want latency to be as low as possible, you might favor at a high level. There's you know two protocols, UDP and TCP. You might favor UDP for video streaming. Now that's probably a better choice for video live streaming because you know as like a sports game is going on, if you miss one second of it, you don't want to go back to that one second, you want to keep up with the most up-to-date information. So you want to say, you know, what's happening in real time. That's what you would want if you were live streaming something or watching a live stream. That's what UDP favors. But with an actual video, we know that video is stored somewhere and we want to watch the entire video. If you're watching like a movie or something on YouTube, you don't want like to miss, you know, two seconds of it because that might be like the actual plot point. So TCP is favored for reliability. That will ensure that we get the entire video. There's not going to be any missing gaps in the video. And sure, it might take longer to do that. But as long as we send it in small chunks, it should be okay. And that's exactly what we saw was happening with YouTube. It was sending HTTP requests, which are built on top of TCP. So I think that is kind of also another important question in the context of YouTube compared to a lot of like other system design problems. And also there's a lot of other things we could explore with this, especially when it comes to uploading videos, keeping things at a high level, we'd probably want to rate limit this. We don't want somebody to just be able to upload like an infinite number of videos or you know that could be implemented in the load balancer itself which we kind of like omitted from this design but we know it does exist also when it comes to recommendations for youtube videos or even searching we'd probably want to have you know other auxiliary services which read from our metadata and we probably want to store like a history of what types of videos does this person watch what types of videos do they like so we can kind of build some recommendation for them and for you know searching videos that could be its own topic like that's kind of like designing Google search because there's a lot of like indexing you can do. You probably do want to incorporate uh, recommendations with searching as well, but also, you know, you want to have like the metadata, like the description, the title, how many views does a video have, which videos are most relevant when searching, uh, which types of strings. We could have some autocomplete with that. And those most likely would be built on top of this, or those would be built separately from this kind of core functionality. Now, one last thing I wanted to cover, because I think it's always interesting to to understand how this type of service was actually built. What YouTube actually did was not use a NoSQL database. They actually used MySQL, which is a relational database management system. Now you might be wondering why didn't they use NoSQL? And I definitely don't know the details. One guess I have is that YouTube was actually first created, I think in like the early 2000s, maybe 2004 or 2005. And MongoDB did not exist at that point. And they probably didn't need to handle the same scale that they do right now. But 
but as time went on, they found that they did need to scale their database. I think what they first did was added read-only replicas because of course this is a read-heavy system. So reading is gonna be more common than actually you know uploading new videos. But even then they ran into issues and next they tried to add sharding. And so they sharded their MySQL database and they ended up having a lot of complex code in their application server, which properly routed uh, user requests to the correct shard. I'm not exactly sure which shard key that they used, but that's what they did. And then eventually the long-term solution they found was by building a new engine. It's called Vitesse. I'm actually not sure how it's pronounced, maybe Vitesse, but this was something that was created at YouTube. And this is basically to decouple the application layer from the database layer. The application layer should not have to know about how the database is sharded. So Vitesse was added like as a middle layer in between the application servers and the database, at least at a high level. And that is kind of where all the logic for sharding and routing the requests correctly lives. And this is kind of how they were able to take even a relational database like MySQL and scale it up. Now, maybe if they could go back in time, they would have started with a NoSQL database in the first place, or maybe, you know, some other type of database, but they did find a way to get MySQL to work. And actually, Vitesse was later open source, and it's actually a very popular project that's still being used. It's very modern. It's very, very powerful. It's being used by new companies like PlanetScale, which are taking, you know, MySQL and then adding Vitesse to it and just, you know, selling that as a product and, of course, adding more functionality. But this kind of shows you when you reach problems in distributed systems, that can kind of breed a lot of ingenuity and resourcefulness, and you can kind of overcome a lot of limitations that, you know, we would look at and say, oh, MySQL, if we're dealing with a lot of read scale and we don't need an eventual consistency is fine, we can just use a NoSQL database, but they found MySQL to work. And if you found that interesting, you can kind of read a brief history of YouTube um, and MySQL and Vitesse in like the Vitesse docs here and probably other places on the internet.